I'm Anthony L. Elder, president and founder of OACA, the afro Eurasian Original Christian Association. So you understand, before there was the name Buddhist, the original Christians were black Buddhists. Until the first century AD, where the religion bifurcated into what is known as Christianity. See, Buddhism bifurcated in the West and it became Christianity. And in the East, there was a new religion that it bifurcated to call Mahayana Buddhism. Now, my lecture today is titled Buddhism and the Whitney Houston movie. How many of you have seen the movie I Want to Dance, the new Whitney Houston movie? On December the 24th, 2023, that was Christmas Eve, I intensely went and I watched the Whitney Houston movie. And the reason that I went to watch the movie is because I wanted to get inspired and hopefully I could create a Buddhist lecture on Buddhism in the Whitney Houston movie. You see, what I try to do with the Buddhist teachings, I try to teach a Buddhism outside of the realm of Mahayana Buddhism or how we know Buddhism. See, Mahayana Buddhism is the time in history where all black culture, history, and language was extricated out of the Buddhist religion. So when we see Buddhism and we see Asians who actually practice Buddhism, most are Mahayana Buddhists, and what you see are Asians doing meditation and, and what have you, and Buddhism look like an oriental thing. However, when you go back to the ancient teachings of Buddhism, you see, it was black people who founded the Indus Valley Civilization where Buddhism arrived and they were the Afro-Asians and Buddhism eventually became what we know today as Christianity. But anyway, let's get into our lecture. Again, it's called Buddhism and the Whitney Houston movie. Now, years ago, and I did a lecture called Buddhism and Aretha Franklin. And before then, I did a, uh, a lecture called Buddhism and James Brown. Now, my being a black Buddhist, I look for ways to educate individuals about Buddhism or about the original Christians. Now, when I left that movie theater, I was troubled and I struggled to find a way to use the movie to introduce Buddhism or the original Christian perspective. You see, unknown and untold, I am Memphis' first independent feature filmmaker. And what I look to do is to look at what the director of the movie, what is it that they're trying to portray in the movie. For example, um, I was troubled because what I noticed about the movie, I said, this is a white movie. This movie is designed for white marketing. And one of the interesting things that they want to portray in the movie, uh, they want to portray, I guess what they call the binary lifestyle or say a white gay culture. You see, it's so acceptable at this date and time that when you can take an african-american and you can associate them with the gay culture then this is a way to sell and to make the movie more appealing to a white audience now first let's look at the fact of the movie now there's a scene in the movie that really troubled me and what they did was, what you have to understand is that Whitney Houston is the product of a white 
marketing culture where they created a black princess. You so so in creating a black princess, they essentially created a fantasy or a white or a black princess who is accepted to white America. That's who this black princess is. A pretty well much a fantasy or something that you do not see in the black community. Now, the black community actually uh, had complaints about Whitney Houston. Now, my role in talking about the movie, I Want to Dance with Somebody, I am not coming to you as a film critic, but I'm coming to you as a black Buddhist teacher. Now, I'm not a film critic. I'm not saying whether the movie was good or whether the movie is bad. What I am doing is giving you an African and an African-American black Buddhist perspective of the movie. Now, one of the things that troubled me about the movie was they showed a scene in the movie that noted that the black community had complained that Whitney Houston was not black enough. Now, Whitney had won all kind of awards. She was the number one singer. She's got the soul. She got everything. Now, you see, in 1989, at the Soul Train Awards, Whitney Houston was booed. Now, what they talk about in the movie, they talk about that Whitney was not black enough. And I think that what the director did, the director of the movie purposefully did not tell the black side as to why Whitney Houston was booed at the Soul Train Awards and why African Americans had a problem with, with Whitney Houston. Now, the best way to explain why Whitney Houston was booed, I think that is a Afrocentric writer and his name is Ta Nehisi Coates. Now, he explains it in one of the articles that he wrote, and this is what he said about Whitney Houston. He said, quote, the gift of black music, of black art, is unlike other in America because it is not simply a matter of singular talent or even tradition or lineage, but something more grand and monstrous. He points, his point was that African American musicians are expected to represent more than single, simply themselves. They must represent the culture and their history. The gift, this gift, can never wholly belong to a single artist, free of expectation and scrutiny, because of the gift is no more solely theirs than the suffering that produced it." Unquote. You see, Whitney Houston comes from the lineage of black people, black artists, and she represents more than herself. And now, we are looking at when she first became an artist in the 1980s at 22 years old. Now, she's 22 years old, and what we had going on as an artist, we were getting into the candy cloth, we are getting the things, we are getting the black culture. And one of the things that Whitney did not represent, she did not represent herself as identifying and becoming a, a model for black pride and black culture. You know, that's what they had a problem with Whitney with. Now, let me give you an example. All the popular forms of music in America originated from black people. America would not be what it is not for black culture. Please note that the original music in America is the Negro spirituals and all the forms of popular, popular music culture that makes America what it is, the dancing and the music, 
All of this comes from black people. However, African Americans and black people are not given credit for our contributions. We're not given the contributions in America. We're not honored for this contribution that we have given to America. Now, by me saying this, you would say, or you would think, you would say Anthony Elmore is racist by me saying it. But what I want you to do, I want you to first of all, listen to Michael Jackson, who was the king of pop, who was a black man who changed himself to accommodate the white people, like he changed his hair, he changed his nose. He did what he could do to make himself ac acceptable to the white culture. Now, let's listen to Michael Jackson explain this, and we're gonna come back, and we're gonna finish our lecture. What is this called? Buddhism and the Whitney Houston movie. Let's listen to Michael Jackson. Listen to Michael Jackson tell you that all of the history, all of the song, all of the dance comes from black people. They don't teach you this in the history books. I'm tired. I'm really, really tired of manipulation. I'm tired of the way they use the press is manipulating everything that's been happening in this situation. They do not tell the truth, they lie. And they manipulate, they manipulate our, they manipulate our history books. The history books are not true, it's a lie. The history books are lying. You need to know that. You must know that. All the forms of popular music, from jazz to hip hop to bebop to, uh, to, to soul, you know, to um, uh, talk about the different dances from the cakewalk to the jitterbug to the Charleston to uh, break dancing, all these are forms of black dancing. What, what's, more, what's more important than giving people a sense of escapism? And escape is a meaning entertainment. What would we be like without a song? Okay. What would we be like without a dance? These things are very important, but if you go to the bookstore down the corner, you won't see one black person on the cover. You'll see other person. teachings of Buddhism as taught by the 13th century black Japanese Buddhist sage Nichiren Shonen who teaches us that the highest teachings of the Buddha Shakyamuni is only the Lotus Sutra. The Lotus Sutra explains everything from the standpoint of cause and effect. You see, we who practice Buddhism 
chant the words Namu Nyoho Renge Kyo. See, the word Namu means to awaken. Now, the word Nyo means correct. The word Ho means law. Now, the word Renge is a metaphor that means um, lotus, but that means the cause and effect or lotus means the flower and the fruit comes together. It represents cause and effect. And the word kyo means teachings or to dispel delusion. Now, that is a theory in Buddhism. And this gohanzan that we practice, which, let me show you the gohanzan. This gohanzan, this is this scroll right here. Now, this scroll is represented by a teaching in Buddhism. I'm going to close the altar back. This scroll is represented by a teaching called Itchinin Sanzan. Now, Itchinin Sanzan means literally 3,000 worlds in a momentary state of existence. You see, everything in the universe is moving. Everything in the universe is going through flux. That is, it goes to what they call in Buddhism, Jo, Ju, A, and Ku, or birth, growth, maturity, and death. Now, all phenomena goes to these 3,000 realms of states. Now, for example, there is a teaching in the Lotus Sutras that says, all Buddhas know the entity of all phenomena, and that is called the Ten Aspects. That is, all phenomena has what? An appearance, number one. It has a nature, number two. It has an entity. Appearance, nature, and an entity creates, number four, what is called an influence. And because it has an influence, it has what? Number five. And that is, it creates a power. You got an influence, you got a power. Now, among that, you got what is called an inherent power cause. Now you got an inherent cause and then you have what is called what we call karma or there's a relationship and then there's a latent effect, there's a manifest effect and all of these ten aspects are consistent from beginning to the end. Now I know this sounds quite theoretical but I'm trying to bring this home to you in regards to Whitney Houston. You see there are 10 aspects, but there are also 10 worlds. These worlds are number one, you got the lowest world, it's called hell. Number two, you got hunger. Number three, you got animality. That is, you live on your instincts. Hell, hunger, animality. You got four, which is called uh, anger. The number five is called humanity. Now, the sixth world, is the world that a lot of people try to get into and that is the world of heaven. That's called heaven. Now, we who are Buddhists don't strive to get into heaven, but we strive to go to our higher life conditions. And from the uh, six lower worlds, you got the world called learning. And then you got the, that's the seventh world. Then the eighth world is called self-realization to where you look inside yourself and you begin to realize and understand phenomena. Now, that ninth world is the world called Bodhisattva or it's called Christ-like. And the tenth world is where we try to reach. And this is called Buddhahood or total, absolute, indestructible happiness or it is a spiritual level to where we develop ourselves or we commit ourselves to our development. It is, a, it is a spiritual level, but we'll get into this. Now, the reason that I mention this, because we're using this to explain with Houston. You see, there are 10 aspects and then there are 10 worlds. So each world can exist within each world, which is 100 worlds times the ten aspects, which is the thousand worlds. Now the thousand worlds leads us into what is called the three realms. Now you got the three realms, you got one, the realm of the five components. That is, you got the form, like the form of Whitney Houston. Then you got 
preception, the form where you can perceive it. You got form, preception, conception, volition, and then you got consciousness. And then you got the realm of living beings, and you got the realm of this environment. Now, all of us are going in flux in the universe, and we all live in all these different worlds. Now, the reason I wanted to explain this to you is because, now, take Whitney Houston, for instance. Whitney Houston got into the world of hell, meaning this, you, even though she is a, the number one recording artist and she won all of this and she won all of that and she went into heaven, but her life is not just this plain and simple goody two-shoes woman, but let's get into it. Now, you see, Regarding Whitney Houston, you will never find her as a black woman. Let me explain. Depending on your karma, some people can transition to being white. This depends on your karma. Like Spike Lee talked about this in one of his movies, where some of the black people are considered black and they are accepted by white people. Now, there are black people who are more racist then white people, one example is that of Enrico Torrio, the former Afro-Cuban leader of the Proud Bowls with Donald Trump. Black Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas hates black people. There are black people who sell their souls for success. Now, Dr. Whitney Houston. You see, Whitney Houston is the result of white acceptance or blacks who are made uh, white America, who are made in white America, accepted into the fold of white America. You see, in other words, Whitney Houston was a black woman accepted into the fold of white America. You get it. The gold show reads, only Buddhists know that you enter through all phenomena. You see, in common sense terms, Whitney Houston was made and not born. You see, Whitney is the product of a white marketing strategy. You see, they made Whitney, they took this beautiful young girl and they made her, they shaped her, they created an image and they created what we know as Whitney Houston. Now, I want you to think about the mind and background of Whitney Houston. Now think about this. Whitney's brother, Michael Houston, gave his sister on her 16th birthday, he gave his sister some marijuana and some cocaine. Now what kind of brother would give his sister some cocaine on her birthday and some marijuana, getting her sister high. In other words, there's Whitney Houston at 16 years old, was getting high, doing drugs, and engaging into a lifestyle that was nothing like the princess who we know. You see, in fact, her friend, you know, her friend Robin. Now, her friend Robin says that Whitney's former lover writes that Whitney started drugs at 14 years old. Whitney was not some innocent church girl. It is written that she was molested by her cousin, Dee Dee Warwick, that's Dion Warwick's sister, who had sex with both Whitney and Whitney's brothers when they were young children. Now, please note, that Whitney was a 22 year old when her first album released. Now at 22, she had experienced all kind of sex with male and female and drugs and she became famous and a princess in America. Now, Whitney got with Bobby Brown and, and because uh, Bobby was black and they shared a culture with Bobby Brown, Witness prestige, pristine image did not even match Bobby Brown, who was accused of making Whitney go bad. Now, 
Whitney already was nothing nice. In fact, Bobby Brown tells the story that he saw her before the wedding. He goes back and see her and she had a big old powder of cocaine and she was doing cocaine before they got married. And she said, you want some? You see, she was more into drugs than Bobby Brown. But what we see in America, we see this beautiful, pristine image of Whitney Houston, but Whitney Houston was already on drugs. Now, let me share something with you about Buddhism. You see, just like in the Christian religion, there are God and there's the devil. Well, you see, Christianity came from Buddhism. You see, this story of Jesus going 40 days and 40 nights, it's the story that came from Buddhism called the temptation of Mara, where the Buddha goes 40 days and 40 nights, and he was tempted by this bad god. This god was called Mara. Now, Mara is known, his, his formal name is Dairoko Tenyo Mara. Now, I'm telling you to see you black way. Now, you see, I've always used to talk about this God, Dairoko Tenyo Maya, because Dairoko Tenyo Maya is the baddest God, is the baddest devil. He is the baddest devil because, see, other devils come get you and make life hard. But now when it comes to Dairoko Tenyo Maya, Dairoko Tenyo Maya, he gets you because he plays on your ego. He plays on your weaknesses. You see, he says, oh, you want to have some drugs? Okay, I give you more drugs. You want to have sex? I give you more sex. I give you more of this. You don't need to struggle. You don't need to work out. What you need to do is just relax and have a good time. Now, what Dairoko Tenyo Mile, a king devil did, was he put King, he put Whitney Houston, he grabbed her to where, hey, you want to get high? So she can afford to get high, she can do drugs, she can do alcohol, she can do smoking, she can do everything. But they also put everybody around her in the world of animality. Remember I told you you got these ten worlds, right? You got hell. Well, they wasn't in hell. They weren't necessarily in hunger, but the people around Whitney Houston was in the world of animality. The world of animality is where the strong prey on the weak. And so all of these people around Whitney Houston was in the world of animality because Whitney was making a whole lot of money. She was taking care of a whole lot of people and the brothers and the family and everybody else could get on board. And so Whitney was doing her drugs, so they could not tell Whitney, so, well, you don't need to do no drugs because they would fire you. So they give her more drugs, give her more of this, tell her she's this, tell her that. And she did not have nobody around her that could tell her, you need to stop, you need to make a decision, you need to go get some help. Yeah, they put her into the hospital. They put her into rehabilitation two or three times. But, you see, when she lived in this world of Dairoko Tenyo Maya, the king devil, the king devil caught her off guard all the time. Now, you see, Dairoko Tenyo Maya is bad. Now, speaking of Dairoko Tenyo Maya, See, he don't operate like other devils. See, now look at Whitney Houston and look how she's on the cover in 1981, 17 years old. Now, we let's go to her debut album in 1985, uh, the, the, the album titled Whitney. This was the best selling new artist of the 1980s. She came up with the perfect all-American girl image. Whitney Houston was not just a singer. She represented a pride and a celebration of black America, the girl next door. Whitney was adopted by white America. She was tall and had the structure of a white woman and the voice of a sister. 
Now we come to Dalaroko Tenyo Ma. The devil of the sixth heaven not only did with the devil of the sixth heaven defeat Whitney, they defeated everybody around him. Let, let me give you an idea of the devil of the sixth heaven. When I was a little kid, I had a paper route. So I made a little money, and they had this little old woman who used to sell candy apples. And because I had money as a paper boy, I used to go to this little old, little old woman's house, and I used to buy them candy apples. And, that, and my parents never took me to a dentist a day of my life. And I'd go buy these candy apples and I had money. And do you know, I'd go to this little old woman's house and I'd buy these candy apples and that little sugar she had on the candy apples rotted my teeth out as a young man. You see, that's that local 10 year mile. See, some people make a success not because of what they have, but some people fall because what they don't have. See, you can have too much. You see, Whitney Houston had too much. You see, we can talk about Whitney Houston, but there's a culture in America that is worse than cocaine. When I was a kid, I was a part, and I'm just now realizing of America's addictive culture. I, you know, this old lady used to have me go to the store every day, and she said, boy, I want you to go to the store and I want you to bring me a goodness headache powder. And they ain't got no goodness headache powder. Bring me a BC headache powder and a Coke. And every day this woman get a BC headache powder, powder and a Coke. I see these little old black ladies, they were talking, they got, got the back in their mouth. Uh, go to the store and go and get me some snuff. Now, these folk was on drugs. Snuff is a drug. They go, go get me some Palmel cigarettes and some Camel. So you smoking Palmel cigarettes, you smoking Camel. They was advertising cigarettes and man, cigarettes was killing folk. You had all these old ladies, they fat, they old, they out of shape. And they were dying early because what? They was addicted. Now, we talk about the overlord crisis of today. You see, the number one killer of accidental death in America is legal drugs. Not only do you have illegal drugs, but you got legal drugs. And then that's Whitney Houston when she died. She had a combination of illegal drugs like cocaine, but she had all these other drugs. So was Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson was on drugs. Legal drugs. He'd go to the profilum and the drugs that make you sleep. And he was on drugs, legal stuff. You see, doctors will put you more on legal drugs than you can than there are illegal drugs. You see, Dioko Tenyo Mayo is the God or the devil. You see, getting up in the morning, running. It's hard passing up with the dessert. Let's simply take potato chips. You see, having potato chips, they really don't have no kind of nutritional value. They're high in calories. They loaded with sodium, fat, and preservatives. See, see, these cokes that we love so much is filled with so much sugar. <laughs> and what can be addictive is sugar. You see. These are the pleasures of the Rocco Tenyo Mile. You see, we gain too much weight, and we, as Americans, live an unhealthy lifestyle. Now, let's get back to Whitney Houston. She walked into the arms of the Rocco Tenyo Mile, unknown and untold. You see, happiness is a skill. Let me repeat, happiness is a skill. You see, Happiness is a skill, and listen very carefully, wisdom is a practice. Listen to me again, wisdom is a practice. You see, why in the world do we practice Buddhism? We practice Buddhism because 
wisdom is a practice and Buddhism is the practice of wisdom. You see, we chant the words, Namo your holding get kyo. Now, you gotta understand, let's take Whitney Houston. It's no doubt that Whitney experienced a living hell. Imagine having everything that money can buy. But the one thing that money cannot buy is peace of mind. Please note that wisdom is a practice. Let me explain. You see, I am a five-time world karate kickboxing champion. And you struggle. You get up every morning and you run and you struggle and you exercise and you sacrifice and you do all the things that it takes to be a champion. But once you get to be the champion, we have a tendency to be attacked by Daroko Tenyo Mile that you don't need to get up and go run this morning. You are laying in this bed and you land with a woman with a fat behind and pretty and you say, well, I'll just run later on today or I'll run tomorrow. You see, understanding Wisdom is a practice. So if you don't get nothing else, understand. Wisdom does not come from one's aptitude. But wisdom comes from one's attitude. And that attitude is spiritual. That in order to gain, in order to grow, in order to be the person that you should be is comes from the practice of wisdom. And the practice of wisdom is to develop the proper attitude to give in the morning and to pray and to humble yourself and to study. But it's your attitude, not your aptitude. That is what the Buddhist practice is all about. So if you want to know what Buddhism is, Buddhism is spiritual. Buddhism is developing your proper attitude. Now, you take a Whitney Houston. What was her attitude? What's the word to describe Whitney Houston? The word to describe Whitney Houston is called artificial. Because many people try to find an artificial sense of happiness. They take a drug, they take this, they take this, they buy this, they buy that. They try to find an artificial form of happiness instead of the spirit of wisdom to where you work out and where you train yourself to go through the hard days. You go through having to give up eating this food and that food. You always train yourself and you constantly train yourself to become a better person. So when you say you practice Buddhism, we mean we practice wisdom or we practice ways to continually better ourselves. Anyway, I hope you got something out of this lecture. Anyway, I am Anthony L. Elmore, president of Accor, the Afro-Asian Original Christian Association. Anyway, thank you very much.